study of Elijah. We talked about him a little bit last week and uh, how important he was in the Bible. We talked about Elijah maybe being one of the last prophets in the end times. We talked about Elijah as appearing on a mountaintop talking with Jesus and Moses. And we talked about Elijah being uh, John the Baptist coming either in the spirit of Elijah or being Elijah to come to prepare the way of the Messiah, Jesus. Elijah is a very important prophet in the Bible. Now he wasn't a writing prophet. You know, most of the prophets in the Bible, we have a book named after them, like Habakkuk or Amos or Daniel. But there's no book called Elijah. Elijah was not a writing prophet. He didn't write that we know of, nothing that we've saved. But he was a powerful, powerful person. Did you know that all through the history of the Bible, there weren't always people going around doing miracles? Remember the story of Moses? Well, Moses lived about 500 years before Elijah. Five centuries. Moses did a lot of miracles through the power of God. Or you could say God did a lot of miracles through Moses. He was a miracle man, a miracle worker. But then 500 years later, the next miracle worker that came along was Elijah. And then his protege, Elisha, also did miracles. And then we have a thousand years almost before Jesus came and another age of miracles began. We believe we're still living in an age of miracles today, amen? Amen. If you believe that God is real and that he hears you when you pray, that alone is a miracle. If you believe that God hears you when you pray, then you must also believe that he is God of miracles. That's why we pray for everything that we need. So Elijah was a miracle worker through the power of God. Now one thing that's interesting about the Bible, it's so condensed, it's packed so tight and full. You can read one sentence in the Bible, and if it was someone writing a novel, it would have been a whole chapter. If you're watching a TV series, it would have been a whole episode. But in the Bible, it's packed into one verse. So you gotta read it slow you got to listen carefully. So I'm going to be in 1 Kings chapter 17. Today I'm reading out of the King James Bible. Can you hear me all right? <laughs> Praise God. It's so good to be out here among the people, isn't it? And we don't mind a little noise once in a while because God has put us where we need to be, out among the people, outside of the walls of the church. Chapter 17 of 1 Kings. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto King Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain in the coming years, but according to my word. There's a lot packed in there. This is the first time we meet Elijah in the Bible. They didn't give a lot of background on him, not a lot of history. It just, Elijah, he was a Tishbite. And he was in the inhabitants of Gilead. So you tell us kind of who he was, what clan or group or family he belonged to, and where he came from. It's one thing I love about the Bible. It isn't a bunch of fairy tales. You know, fairy tales start off like this. Once upon a time in a land far away, there was a princess. But the Bible always gives us dates and times, when things happened, who it was, where it happened. And it gives us history that's accurate and true. You know, back 150 years ago, there was very little proof of the Bible as a historical book. And all the smart people in the world kept saying, the Bible's myths, the Bible's fairy tales, it's not historically accurate. But starting in the early 1800s, discoveries were made over and over and are being made today that prove over and over the Word of God is accurate and true. But the smart people, are still saying the same old thing they were saying back 200 years ago. It's a bunch of fairy tales. It's not historically accurate. But the more we learn, the more we find out. The more we dig into the earth and, and discover things, the more we find out the Word of God is true and it's accurate and it's supported by archaeology and science. So here he is, the Tishbite from the land of Gilead, and he talks to King Ahab. Now, King Ahab was the most evil king in the whole Bible. There were a lot of bad kings in the Bible. He was the king of Israel, sometimes called Samaria, his capital city, Samaria. He was the most evil. He married a woman that was from a foreign country who was the daughter of a priest and king 
of a foreign religion and he allowed her to bring in her foreign religion and not worship the true God. And he completely supported her in doing this and became a follower of a false religion. Now this guy Elijah, he goes to King Ahab. Now remember in those days, you can't go up to a king and just talk to a king. You'd probably have yourself killed. You could only talk to a king if you were invited to come to talk to the king. He was very brave. Can you imagine this person, Elijah? He's got no wife, he's got no children, he doesn't have really anywhere to live half the time. And this is pretty poor. He walks up to the king. It's hard to imagine that. I know I get nervous just talking to the city council sometimes. <laughs> but he walked up to the king who could have killed him, probably would have killed him. He risked his life. Elijah was so brave. And he was walking in the power of God, and that's what gave him his bravery, his courage. Because we'll find out later in the story that he wasn't always very courageous. He could be very cowardly at times. And he walks up to the king, and he speaks in the name of God. He says, As the Lord of God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be no dew or rain these years, but according to my word. He's speaking for God, the true God, the God that lives. He mentions that, the God that lives. Today, people say God is dead. Nietzsche was the famous one that said it first, and remember, saying God is dead. But according to my word, now verse, see how it's just, that was just verse one. See how it's packed in there? Number two, and the word of the Lord came to him saying, verse three, get thee hence and turn thee eastward and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. So now God has told him to go before the king. Now God's telling him to go run away and hide out. God has a plan and God's going to make, make the plan work. He tells him to go across the Jordan, that's outside of the, the, the nation of Israel, <clears throat> and hide yourself by the brook Cherith that is before the Jordan River. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook and I've commanded the ravens to feed thee there. We mentioned the ravens the last couple of weeks. How ravens represent God's provision. Even though it's not a perfect bird, it's an unclean bird. Did you know that according to the Bible, the eagle is an unclean bird too? The eagle is called an abomination in the Bible. And that's one reason, like Ben Franklin, he wanted the turkey to be the symbol of our country instead of the eagle. Because Benjamin Franklin said the eagle is a scavenger. Now, have you ever been to the dump? Now the dump that we go to out here in 98, there's one part of the dump that's real stinky where all the household garbage goes. And when we drive up there, we see thousands of vultures and we always see four or five bald eagles because they're scavengers. Now sometimes they do fish and hunt for wild food, but they're basically scavengers. And that's why the Bible calls them unclean and that's why Ben Franklin wanted the turkey to be the symbol of our country. He said it's a noble bird. So here are these ravens. They're considered unclean animals in the Bible, which means you don't eat them because they're scavengers. See, ravens are closely related to the crows that we have around here. Ever gone down the road, you see vultures, and sometimes you see crows eating the carrion that's on the road, the roadkill. I had some roadkill myself yesterday. Yes, I did. Uh, my wife doesn't want me to tell the story, but I did, I did have some roadkill yesterday. I went to the gas station near my house on my bicycle and I bought some wings. And they were overpriced, $7 for five wings. They were pigeon wings, they weren't very big. <laughs> and then I was gonna ride my bike back to the big pine track forest where there's a picnic table. So right before I get there, my little <coughs> thing holding the wings fell off the back of my bike and fell onto the road. And all my wings fell out onto the road. Well, thank God there were no cars coming <laughs> I got off my bike and put all the wings back in the container, <laughs> strapped it back on the bungee cord, went to the picnic table and had a nice pigeon wing roadkill dinner. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> yeah. Alright, so... God says to him, I have commanded the ravens to feed these. See, God is in control of everything. God is in control of nature, of the animals. God created everything. He commanded the ravens to feed him. And you can be a raven to feed and help other people. 
and God will send you a raven when you need it most, right? All right, so he went, Elijah, he went, and did according to the word of the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? He went and did according to the word of the Lord. How many of us obey God when he tells us to? I've tried to obey God. Sometimes God just puts something on my heart, someone I need to go see, or something I need to do. And one time, many, many years ago, God put on my heart to go visit a certain friend, an old friend, that was in jail. And I, I didn't go. I didn't take the time. I didn't, you know, when am I going to do that? You know, whatever. And then he ended up killing himself and dying. And I would just wish I had went and visited him. Maybe the words that we spoke or the prayers that we would have would have saved his life. But I didn't do it. So when you hear the voice of God, you've got to obey and do what he tells you to. This is one of the great things about Elijah. When he heard the word of God, he didn't question. He obeyed it. And he did it. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, which is meat, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank the water from the brook. Verse 7, And it came to pass after a while, the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. So now he doesn't have the water to drink. I don't want to think you want to eat a lot of bread and meat and have no water. You wouldn't last long without water. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belonged to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to sustain thee. So now the ravens aren't going to be coming and bringing him food anymore. Now he's not going to be drinking from that same brook anymore. But you know what God does? When one source dries up, he brings us another, doesn't he? I know I got fired from a job once. And I went right out and opened my own business, Rock and Blues Academy. And uh, it was called Shepherd Music back then. And God just blessed it. When one brook dries up, one source dries up, God brings another. So don't ever worry that God's going to take care of you. What you depended on is gone. Sometimes God does that to us on purpose, right? We get dependent on something. We're not dependent on God anymore. He just pulls it right out from under us. We got no choice, it's sink or swim. We gotta depend on God and have faith in God or not. Some tragedy happens in our life, something goes wrong financially. Anything in our life just pulls the rug right out from under us. And God's like, are you gonna still trust me? Are you still gonna look for another source of food and water? But Elijah had that kind of faith. That's one of the great things about Elijah. So he, God said to him, I commanded a widow woman to sustain thee. Now how unlikely was it that ravens would bring you food and meat and bread. Very unlikely, right? Now he's telling him, okay, there's a widow woman that's going to take care of you and feed you. Now in those days, to be a widow was a very difficult thing. It was a guarantee of just living in poverty the rest of your life, right? And being looked down upon if you didn't have a husband. So he's going to send her to a very unlikely person to take care of him. Well, he probably figured, well, if the birds were feeding me, I guess I can handle believing that a widow could feed me too, right? So he rose and he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was then gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me a little water and a vessel that I may drink. So he comes to the city, and here she is outside of the city walls, and she's picking up sticks to build a fire, to do some cooking. He recognized her somehow. Perhaps God told him, this is the woman, this is the one that's going to take care of you. He was going to be dependent on a woman. Isn't that wonderful in the Bible? God used women so many times to get things done. You know, it's true today, too. If you want to get something done, ask a woman. <laughs> They'll get it done. You know? They'll get it done. Us guys, we're like, yeah, we'll watch TV or whatever. <laughs> What's the definition of so we really appreciate the women and their role in the church and their role in the Bible. He says, fetch me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he yelled and said to her, bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. So he's asking for some water. And when she says, okay, I'll, I'll go get you some water. Now there's a drought going on, so asking for water in this story was not that simple didn't have a faucet to turn on and get water. She's asking for a rare commodity, bring me some water. 
She didn't hesitate. She says, okay, I'll bring you some water. She starts walking away to bring the water. And what does he do? He yells out, oh, by the way, can you bring me some food too? I'm hungry, not just thirsty. I need some food. Well, that was a lot to ask at this, during this drought. And, he, and she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake or loaf of bread. This is King James Version today. But a handful of meal in a barrel and a little bit of oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering these sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Now this twice in these few chapters we're going to hear about somebody planning to die. This lady had given up on life. Her faith in God was not great. She wasn't depending on his miraculous provisions anymore. She said, all I have is a little bit of grain in the bottom of this big container that used to be full of grain. Just a little handful, a handful in the bottom. And, um, and the cooking oil and the oil we use to cook, it's, it's, it's almost gone. I have enough to make a little meal for my son and I, and then we're just going to sit down and we're going to starve ourselves to death. We're just going to die. How depressed she must have been. How much she had lost hope. You don't have to raise your hand on this one, but anybody here ever lost hope? Anybody ever lost hope? All right. Kendra, right? All right. So many of us come some point in life where we do lose hope. But look what God did. He sent the prophet to her. He sent the word of God to her. It came to her. And not only was that to lift her up and bless her, but she got the opportunity to take care of another person. Don't you know that taking care of other people will pull you out of your depression and your sense of loss? Helping others brings you a sense of purpose in life. And it's important that all of us are involved in helping others with our time and our finances. So she, she and her son were going to just go in there and die. And Elijah said to her, fear not. See, right away he realizes she's living in fear. She's not living in the security with the Lord like she should. She's living in fear. There's so many things to be afraid of today. But we don't live in fear. It's perfect love cast out all fear. <coughs> he said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said. But make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it to me. And after that, make it for thee and thy son. So make, give my bread and water first, which she thinks that's all she's got left. He says, then after that, if you want to sit down and die, go ahead. See, he said, go and do as you said. See, go and do as you said. Sit down and starve and die. He knew that she was going to see a miracle and it was going to change her life. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day the Lord sent rain upon the earth. And she went and did, according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. All right, that's probably far enough. The story goes on from there. It's very interesting. We'll get to it next week. It's probably enough uh, for today. You know me, I'm not a long-winded preacher. Thank God, huh? Thank the Lord, thank the Lord for that. But uh, there's a great message in here for us today. Are we relying upon God? You know, some people are so smart, they think they don't need God. Some people are so wealthy, they think they don't need God. You know, all of us are dependent upon God. Do you realize that any day everything you have could be gone? Or on any day, everything could come to you and change your life for the better. It doesn't matter. The Bible says that the rain falls on the good and the evil. Did you know that being a Christian and having faith in God doesn't mean that bad things are not going to happen in your life? Did you know that being an evil person doesn't mean that your life won't be full of good things? The rain falls on the good and the evil in this world. Things happen to all of us, no matter how much we love God. But the difference is, when we love God and we follow God, we look to His provisions and His strength, it gets us through anything. <coughs> I just recently had a student that, that passed away. When I was in St. Pete, I had the Rock and Blues Academy, and she was one of our students, and her brother was one of our students, and I knew her mother from high school. She was 27 years old and died on Christmas Day of an unknown heart condition. And I'll be going down there in a couple weeks and performing her funeral service for them. 
when something like that happens, and many of you here have experienced what I'm talking about, have lost a child or a spouse, that's a time where rubber hits the road. Either we're going to keep our faith in God, we're going to depend on God, and we're going to live in love and not fear, or we're going to let it eat away at us. We're going to let it take away our faith. So I challenge you today, whatever you experienced in the past, has it taken away your faith, or has it made your faith stronger? Whatever is going to happen in the coming days, is it going to take away your faith or make your faith stronger? I pray to God today that each one here, their faith will become stronger. And you'll see God's provision in everything. Now, I never want to leave without asking, is there anybody here who's never asked Jesus Christ into your heart? You never received forgiveness for your sins? It's a wonderful thing to be forgiven. You've never reached out and invited Him to live in your heart and receive the gift of eternal life? Anybody here that's never done that that wants to come up today 